What's up, gangsters? It is a quiet Sunday morning out here in the middle of nowhere at Rube Goldberg Enterprises, and I'm just kind of chilling, getting ready to watch some football, American football, that's right, the NFL type. Um, but I thought I would do a little work on a video that uh, I've been kind of building towards for a while, and that is just a sort of collective quick review of uh, a bunch of new tools that have appeared in my workspace lately. Um, just different things that I've wanted to try and check out and uh, yeah, got them all collected together and thought you guys might be interested in seeing, uh, seeing some of them. So without further jaw flapping, let's take a look. Okay, first thing is uh, some new stuff from Ultimate Modeling Products, UMP, uh, Paul Bretland and Leah Larholt. Uh, if you guys have ever followed any of my stuff, you know that their sanding sticks are some of my favorite things. I have been using the same set of thinny sticks that I got uh, from those guys almost two years ago now um, for quite a while. This particular one is one of the 240 grit sticks and um, these things are great. There are some people who have said that they're not durable when you use them with water. Well, that quite frankly is just stupid for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is not meant to be a fine finishing tool. Not at the 240 grit rate anyway. Um, and so there really isn't any need to be wet sanding with it. Um, you're never going to generate enough dust to uh, cause yourself a health problem. I mean, that's just paranoia in the extreme. Um, but um, with, with, with uh, 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 sorry, I'm totally losing my train of thought. What I'm trying to say is that wet sanding is really for when you need to do a really good finish which means that you're gonna be using um, fine grit abrasives. And typically, they're gonna be uh, either straight sandpaper or sanding sponges, because a sanding stick like this is not, again, is not intended to put a real fine finish on something, especially if it's got a curved surface, because these are, are fairly rigid. They have some give to them, but they are fairly rigid. So again, it's, you know, claiming that they fall apart when you're wet sanding with them is kind of silly because number one, uh, you just shouldn't be wet sanding with them that much. And number two, I do wet sand with these at times. Like if I'm just doing some rough finishing of some uh, filler material, like some uh, Bondo uh, 907 spot glazing compound, just to keep them from clogging up, then I'll use them wet. And I haven't had any problem with them falling apart. Um, you'll notice that this one's a little bit clogged up. What you can do with these is just take a little bit of lacquer thinner or acetone on a, on a Q-tip or a rag, and you can clean all of that uh, gunk out of there because it's just collected styrene and resin. And then uh, it'll be clean and good as new. Now, all of that preamble about the UMP Thinny Sticks is uh, leading up to the fact that I was constantly bugging Paul and Lee about introducing something between the 240 and the 1200 because the 240, as good as it is, would sometimes leave some scratches that um, were not uh, immediately taken out by bumping up to the next grit, like a, a 400. And that kind of bugged me, so I was always after him to do... Uh, I was like, hey, why don't you guys do a 400 and an 800? And... Eventually, <laughs> for whatever reason, they finally decided to do it. And I, I was ecstatic. As you can see, they've got these now in 400 grit. And you can see their core of them is yellow, so you can easily identify them. And they've got an 800 grit. Um, so they filled in the range perfectly. And I have been using the heck out of this 400 grit stick, and I just love it. It's like my new favorite thing. It works really, really good. Now, another thing that I love with UMP is their sponges. That's these things right here, 
when you do need to get a little bit more of a curved surface action, these things are, are great. You can see they're super squishy. So they do exactly what you need, need them to do. And I got some more of those. Um, now, one thing I had never tried before, um, and maybe they're new, I'm not really sure, but that's these green things. Uh, one side, I believe, is just a buffer. And the, and the green side is something that's more like, I don't know, like, it, it doesn't, they don't really give you a grit, but it's more like a 1200 or maybe a 1500 or 2000. I don't know. But I love it. This thing is nice and squishy and it's got a, a fine grit abrasive. And so it works really good as, as a finishing tool. Um, when you want to put a, uh, you know, you need a quick way to put a fine finish um, you know, really nice semi-gloss satin kind of a, of a finish on some paint or some primer. Works really nice. One thing I should warn you about though, <laughs> do not use the lacquer thinner trick for cleaning out the uh, gunk um, because you will remove the grit completely. Um, I discovered that the hard way on one of these, but fortunately I have plenty of them, so no big deal. Now, um, in the same vein as sand, these sanding sticks, I recently had the opportunity to check out some of the sanding sticks from uh, Phil Flory, that Flory Modeling Products. I'm sure a lot of you guys are well familiar with Phil. He runs a nice YouTube channel and a forum, and uh, he does uh, does a lot of product reviews and things, as well as uh, sell his own line of, of products. So, uh, I never had a need to buy any of his sanding sticks because I was completely satisfied with the ones that I had from uh, UMP. But my buddy Bill West, who is a good member of the Scale Modelers Critique Group, sent me a bunch of them uh, the other day, and I, I had a, a chance to uh, check them out a little bit. And um, I, yeah, I gotta say, I'm, uh, I'm not a huge fan. Um, you know, you might say, what's the difference? Sanding sticks or sanding sticks, right? Well, yes and no. But how well they work depends a lot on the, uh, the, the core and how stiff it is. And um, for me, I'm one of those guys that likes to know the grit of my sanding materials so that I know that I'm making a logical progression as I work my way from coarser to finer. Some people don't really care about that, but it's important to me. And one thing about these flory sticks is that they're not really uh, labeled. Now, uh, Bill messaged Flory and asked him specifically what the grits were and, and if they were just standard grits that came from the abrasive guys or what, and, and Phil said no, he selected them himself. And uh, apparently what you're supposed to have is that like this gray and black thing is supposed to be a 240-1200 polisher. So, very similar to the 1200-241s that the UMP guys do. And I, there's really not a whole lot of difference here other than in the shape. Um, that, you know, it, it seems to work fine. No, no issue with that one. Um, this uh, blue sponge thing is supposed to be a 240 grit as well, but it seems to be a little gnarlier than 240. Um, I just, I don't know, it just feels that way. Obviously, I don't have any way of really measuring it, but it just seems to be coarser than, than this. I mean, when you look at it super close, I think you can kind of see what I'm talking about, maybe. I mean, again, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, just from looking at it. Uh, through uh, a magnifier or a camera lens, but bottom line is it feels coarser. And when I've tried to use them, that's kind of, of just how it's felt to me as I, as I worked with them. Now, um, what's kind of, kind of odd here is, okay, so Phil has this. 
fine, medium, and coarse. Green core, blue core, and white core. So I have used this right here a little bit. Um, maybe it's this other one, yeah, this other one. Um, as what is supposed to be the finest one. It honestly feels to me a lot like a 240 grit. Um, doesn't feel to me when I use it much like something I would consider a fine abra uh, grit abrasive. The, um, the uh, blue core one here, I guess if that's, if that's what this is, uh, wait, no, we've got the blue core one in here. It's not the sponge, it's the, it's the stick. This blue core one is what's considered the medium grit. And you can see, that's a pretty heavy grit. I didn't even try it, because that's gnarly. I mean, that looks to me like a, a 180 maybe. I don't know, that's not what I would consider a medium grit. Maybe in the woodworking world, but, but not, not for us in the model making space. Uh, then you've got this one, which is the, the white core, which is supposed to be the, uh, the coarse grit. Um, and you can see close up what that looks like. I mean, that is pretty gnarly. But again, how much different does it really look from the blue core? Let's hold all three of these up close to the camera in the uh, correct order. Let me see if I can pull this off with my clumsiness. We'll see. Yep, probably not. <laughs> but anyway, we'll try. Okay, so look, there we go. Uh, the uh, green one is uh, supposed to be the finest one right there on top. The medium is the blue right there in the middle and the coarsest one right there on the end is, is the white. So yeah, the, the white one is definitely much coarser. I mean, that looks to me like a 80 or a 100 grit. I don't know. Um, but, you know, there's, there's what they look like all together. The bottom line that I'm trying to point out is that to me, these are not really, I don't know, they're, they're just, I don't know if it's just because I don't think, I feel like they're effectively labeled or uh, if it's because they just seem to me to be coarser than what's, uh, what's indicated. Um, I've got some other sponges here in my drawer I'm going to pull out. Um, this is a... I believe a 180 grit sponge from uh, from Micromark that I almost never use, and you can kind of compare. So maybe that's what that is. Maybe that that coarse one is supposed to be a 180, and I'm just about 100 points off. I don't know. You can kind of make judgments for yourself. Um, but anyway, uh, I've used them a little bit. I, I wouldn't say that they're terrible by any means, but I just like, I mean, they do their job. The bottom line is grit, grit is grit. Bill said he's kind of found them to be a little uneven and that he gets some scratches that he can't ever seem to get out, um, which to me indicates maybe that the grit was not uh, properly sieved and that there's some larger particles stuck in there someplace. So that's a little bit of, a, of an issue. Um, so I don't know, you know, some of you guys who have used them may love them and may think I'm full of shit, but um, that's just kind of my impression of them. I didn't immediately love them the way that I did with my UMP sticks. And that obviously is a very qualitative <laughs> analysis, but hey, it is what it is. Anyway, moving on from sanding sticks, what else do I have over here? Um, let's see. Wait, here's more polishers from Flory. These green ones look frankly identical to the uh, ones from UMP, and they have some other brand name on them, so I just kind of assume that those are uh, from, you know, like basic, you know, nail polishing supply people. Anyway, enough of that crap. Uh, here we go. 
I recently also got a set of the new, uh, at least to me, uh, scribers from the guys at MRP. Now you guys know MRP is mostly all about paint, um, but they have added a few things to their product line, like some filler materials and these scribing tools. And I thought they were pretty cool, wanted to try them out. Um, you can see that I have modified the handles the way that I do for tools like that to give me better control. And that's something worth mentioning as well. Um, the one there that's gray, I did with just uh, the usual epoxy sculpt from Aves. And that's nice, it's easy to sculpt, it, you know, sets up in about four hours, but it creates a pretty rigid handle. Then Greg Prim, one of our newer guys on SMCG, recommended this stuff called Shugru. And uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it is a moldable compound that uh, can be used to, they say, fix bond, cushion, replace, create, seal, six in one. Anyway, um, it's already blended for you and it comes in these little packets. Um, and all you do is open the packet and start uh, kneading it. Now, you don't really even have to knead it. I mean, you just tear a chunk of it off and mold it into the shape you want. And then you give it about 24 hours to cure out, and it uh, cures into a mostly rigid material. This feels a little less rubbery than I was sort of led to believe it would be, but bottom line is it's a little easier than something like Epoxy Sculpt because um, it's just already, already blended. You don't have to mold two parts together but it does take uh, a little longer to cure. So let's uh, just try them out real quick. I've, I've experimented with them a little bit, uh, just enough to know that I, I like them, but um, they are, I mean, look, they're scribers. Okay, you can see this one, I believe, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be the skinniest one or not but you can you can see what the shape is um, I'll have to look through my optivizer I think this is the thicker of the two um, anyway I'm just I'm just going along an existing groove here and using this to deepen it and it, it does exactly what it should do. Um, and it's nice. Not scratchy at all. You can see that I cut a, a nice, you can see there maybe, uh, there, there it is, a nice curly cue of material that tells you it's nice and sharp and it's cutting material as opposed to gouging it. That's, that's the important thing with scribers is that uh, they are supposed to cut and, and not gouge. Um, and uh, so that's good. Um, let's, here, I'm gonna yank off a piece of my other, one of my other favorite tools uh, is this Hi-Q scribing tape right here. Uh, I should have, I should have done this beforehand, but you guys know I'm terrible at all this live action stuff because I this is part of the reason why because I don't prepare properly so anyway let's just put a piece on here this high Q tape is good it's a lot like Dymo but not as rigid uh, it'll go over a curved surface much better than Dymo will and um, it's not nearly as uh, sticky 
I, it, it's not as prone to lifting paint as Dymo is. Plus, it's easier to get because you can get high Q from uh, Matt Bull over at Hobby World USA. Uh, I was about to say if you're in the United States, but he's been shipping all over the world lately. His path to global domination is proceeding nicely. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at this. This black one is, in fact, the skinnier uh, of, the, of the two scribers. And uh, I haven't, haven't really tried it out yet, so let's see what we get. Yeah, that thing cuts very nicely. Ooh, yeah. That's sharp. I like the angle on it. No dragging, no chattering. That thing right there might become one of my new favorite tools. Uh, again, you can see, nice little curlicue of plastic right there. Uh, now, let's try out this other one. This is just a, uh, a straight point. And so it's not gonna cut, it's gonna gouge. Um, and the only time I use one like this is when I'm doing uh, like using a template and I'm scribing a round hole or a panel outline, for example. But um, since I've got this here, we'll just check it out. Not too bad when you drag it along there. I mean, it it chatters as you would expect because, again, it's gouging and not cutting. And when I peel this dymo off of here you'll see the difference in the type of of line that it creates um, because it'll have uh, little ridges on uh, each side of it and since I've got that dymo tape on there and I kinda would like to compare the width of the narrow versus the wide I'm gonna cut another one here with it with the wider one Oops, slipped a little bit. Got out of my channel. See if we can do a better job over here. That's the thing, if your scribing tool slips once, you really have to stop and evaluate what's going on because it's tough to, tough to straighten that line back out if uh, you don't if you don't work at it. If you just keep scribing without trying to correct it, you're just gonna have a crooked line. And that's no good. Now, see, Dymo, or not Dymo, <laughs> High Q comes right off of there. Um, okay, so, it's kinda difficult for me to tell the difference between the skinny and the wide version of the cut, um, but it is it is definitely a, a difference. You just kind of have to be looking at it at the right angle. But there you go. You guys can judge for yourself up close how that looks. Um, you can hopefully you can kind of see the difference in the line that I scribed with the straight point. It's just a little bit rougher and it has those ridges. The other ones have ridges a little bit too, but part of that's because I'm scribing in paint as opposed to just on bare plastic, which, hey, sometimes you gotta do that. So anyway, those are cool. Those impress me. I'm glad that uh, Martin Schneider, uh, one of the gangsters at uh, MRP sent me those. Um, because the, the, these are, are really good tools. And I like having lots of things in my scribing arsenal. Now, what else I like to have in my scribing arsenal, I mean, not scribing necessarily, um, is files. You guys probably know I'm a big fan of the six inch mill bastard file. I, I, used the, I used the shit out of this thing. It's a very powerful tool. I also, on the other end of the file spectrum, have these micro files from uh, Hobby Elements, which are pretty sweet. Um, these things are great for working in small areas. They come in a number of different sizes. I kind of have a, 
a, a wide and a medium width ones, and then I have these uh, saber-shaped ones. And they have uh, coarse, medium, and fine grit that to me correspond to something like 240, uh, 400, and 800. And these are super handy, not cheap. These are three sets of files here that uh, cost me a total of about a, uh, uh, 75 bucks and took about a month to get from Korea. But they are indispensable in certain situations. However, I wanted something in between. And when Lee uh, Larholt uh, did a little review on the Suji Burrito files on the uh, ISM News show, I was instantly uh, in lust. My uh, inner tool whore was, was screaming that I needed to have these things because they would be somewhere in between the micro files and the six inch file. So they came a couple of days ago and I broke down because I'm just a weak, weak man and I bought all six of them. Um, <laughs> and uh, they are pretty sweet. Um, they have all of this very cool and mysterious writing all over the package. I have no idea what it means, but I assume that it says something to the effect that if I use these, I will not only be much cooler, but my modeling results will be magically improved. Um, I don't know about all that, but they are pretty neat and they come in a variety of shapes. Uh, I've already unpackaged them. I haven't tried them all out yet, but you can see. I mean, these are fairly standard sizes and, and, and shapes for small files. And so you might be wondering, well, what, what's the magic? Um, and the truth is, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I feel like just from the pictures that I had seen that the cut on these was a lot better than a lot of other micro files that I had seen. And I'm looking at them through my optivizer and I feel like that is a is a is a is a belief that was justified. I mean, when you look at that cut, that is a very precise cut and it looks really sharp. Um, some of these cheap files that you get, you know, like at the dollar store, you get a set of six or 12 of them or whatever. I mean, I've, I've had some of them and quite frankly, they've just been junky. The cut's not very precise. They're not very sharp and they, they, they clog up fast and they just don't, they just don't work well. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, doing a quick test with this and yeah that thing is is sharp there's no doubt about it that is a sharp little file and for me that's worth paying for maybe not for everybody because um, this is not a tool that you're going to use necessarily uh, all the time but um, when you need a file it needs to be sharp and it needs to be clean um, so if you have really good files and you take really good care of them, don't let them rust, don't throw them in a drawer with a bunch of other steel tools because they'll rattle around in there and it'll knock the edges off all the teeth. Um, if, you, if you have a good set of files, you take good care of them and you keep them clean. And the trick again is just like with the sanders, use lacquer thinner and a, and a, like a brass brush or a toothbrush. Um, they will serve you for a lifetime. So uh, you can see that's a nice, uh, sharp, clean cut right there. They, they do. They, they perform exactly as I, as I hoped they would. So I feel like this was a good purchase. Again, not cheap. This set of six was about a hundred bucks. And I know that seems crazy. But I just don't ever have a problem spending uh, money on good tools because I want results and I just have seen too often how not having the right tools ends up just being a, a disaster. And it ends up costing you more time and energy in the long run. Speaking of...
tools that cost a lot of money. Obviously, one of the most important tools that we have as model makers is our vision. Now, I have been using a Bausch & Lohm Optivisor for quite a while. I, my, I, I, I can only see up close with reading glasses. I, I have fighter pilot eyeballs for everything else. I can, I can uh, count the legs on a grasshopper at half a mile, but I can't read the damn newspaper anymore without reading glasses. And for really close-up work, I need magnifiers. And so I've been using these Bausch & Lohm magnifiers. They cost about 30 bucks. They have three lenses that come with them. Um, I use the most powerful lens, which is a 2.6 magnifier. You can see it just kind of snaps in there. And it's great because you get a wide field of view, but the disadvantage is that the focal length on them is about that far. And that's why when you guys see me in some of my videos where I'm trying to actually work on camera, you can see the edge of my head and the edge of my optivisor because you have to get so close and get the work right up in your face uh, to make them effective. And that has become a problem for my lower back. So I have been trying out some of these things. These are uh, dental loops. And they uh, I had thought that they were horrendously expensive but I found out that you can get a pair for about 300 bucks, which is probably still horrendously expensive for a lot of people. But when it comes to the health of my spine, I don't really care. There's not a price that's too high. So I ordered these from this place called uh, New York Microscope Company, and that'll be important here in a second. As you can see, it's two and a half power and eight to 12 inch focal length, which I thought would be pretty good. I just, that was my first guess. It turns out that the, uh, well, let me show you what you get. Okay, you get, um, you get the loops. And these are nice. They're, they, you can buy these off of Amazon for 70 bucks, but I read a bunch of the reviews and it seems like the quality of the $70 ones is really cheap. These, you know, they at least feel substantial. The housings for the, for the loops themselves are, um, are, are made out of, of, of steel. The optics are really good. Um, you can adjust the distance between them. Um, so they're good. Um, but it turned out that the uh, uh, 8 to 12 inch focal length was not quite right for me. And these uh, are taking some getting used to. Because while you get a longer focal length, you get a much smaller field of view. So you're looking at basically a little circle of magnification as opposed to a sort of a panorama like you are with the optivisor. And the depth the, the, uh, the depth of field is a little tougher to adjust to. It's really shallow with these. So your work has to be exactly the right distance in order for you to be in focus. So that was a little bit challenging, but I decided that the eight to 12 inch thing was not the right distance. I also realized that I was having to take these off and switch to my readers for just normal stuff like looking at instruction sheets. And I knew that you can get these with a reading glasses magnifier built into this part of the lens. So I decided to send these back. When I was wiping them down with some alcohol to send them back, that happened. There's some kind of a defect. I don't know if you can see it. It's almost like there is a lamination of the Lexan in this lens. Because when I went to wipe that off with alcohol, it's like it wicked right inside of there and immediately looked like some kind of a film that was crinkling up inside there and it never did clear up. So I then had two reasons to return them. Now, I should say that these guys took forever to ship these things to me, and I didn't get them until, and it didn't even happen until I called them like two weeks after I had placed my order and bugged them about it. And uh, they were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll ship them. We didn't process your payment until last week. And, um, so anyway, I got them, I tried them, and I made a good effort to uh, 
to, to, to get used to them. And then when, I, when they didn't work for me, I made what I thought was a polite gesture to wipe them clean before I put them back in the package. Anyway, the point to all this is that uh, when I called to get a, a return authorization, they said, oh, well, the owner of the, of the company has to uh, call you with that. So, uh, like, four days later, and now we're at last week, so I'm, I, I, I've, I've had them for a, about three weeks at, at that point. Uh, I ordered them on, like, the 22nd of August. They didn't process my payment until the 28th of August, and they didn't get here until about a week after that or more. So I've had them at that point that I talked to the guy for less than 30 days. Anyway, the owner finally calls me back, and he says, well, why do you want to return them? And I get about as far as, well, the focal length isn't, and he interrupts me, and immediately starts in on me. Well, you've had these for more than 30 days. Well, no, sir, I haven't, because of blah, blah, blah. The guy just wore me out. Basically, he was 100% rude. And the conversation ended with, you know, I mean, he was just grilling me about, you know, why was I returning them, and why didn't you know these were the correct ones when you ordered them? And now you've damaged them with this, with, with cleaning them. And I said, no, I didn't damage them. They're defective because what I did with the little bit of alcohol should not have ruined any pair of Lexan safety glasses. Anyway, the conversation ended with me saying, look, you just are you going to give me the return authorization or not? And he said, well, I'll have to talk to the manufacturer and then I'll get back to you. That was last Monday, uh, so a week ago, and, he ha and I haven't heard from him. In the meantime, because my buddy Matt McDougall had ordered a pair from this place called Schultz Optical, I ordered these because they also offered uh, the uh, reading glasses uh, insert. I, I thought it was built into the lens, but as it turns out, it's an insert. So you can see that is a clip-on plus one reading glasses magnifier, and it, it works okay, but that little clip-on thing added a hundred bucks to the price. So these were 300 plus another hundred. It's just getting worse, right? Uh, I mean, by the time I pay the restocking fee and the shipping on the return of the other ones, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in this for some money. But again, it's the health of my spine. So anyway, these are basically the same as the other ones. They feel like they're good quality. Matt McDougall really likes his. Um, and these do work better for me with the reading glasses insert, but they still have the issue of a very small depth of field and a very small field of view. Now these have a longer focal length distance. These have a, um, a 420 millimeter focal length, which I believe, if I remember right, is, is the 10 to 14 inch focal length distance. And this may not be right for me either. Now I'm finding that now I have to hold stuff far away to be able to work on it uh, again. So I don't know. Um, but I know that some of the guys in SMCG were kind of following the story of these things. And uh, I thought that, uh, you know, other guys out there probably are in the same situation of trying to figure out how to deal with their aging eyeballs and that uh, you guys might also think it was interesting. So anyway, that's that. Um, I don't know exactly how this vision thing is going to resolve itself. Quite honestly, I'm afraid I'm going to end up returning these as well and, and trying to figure out something else. I have ordered myself some two and a half power reading glasses for 10 bucks off of a uh, Amazon. And uh, those should be here in a couple of days, and I'm going to try those out as well. So, I mean, wouldn't that be ironic if something that cost me 10 bucks ends up being the ultimate solution? I don't know. We'll see. But there you go. That's it. That's a whole bunch of tools to check out. Okay, so there you go. A little bit of a sort of tool tour of some new stuff that I've been checking out. Um, hopefully, uh, you guys found that informative and uh, useful. Uh, if you're like me and you're <laughs> basically willing to try just about any tool once, 
um, then um, maybe that'll be of some use to you. Ah, clearly the tool I need is a fly swatter. Anyway, as always, if you guys have uh, watched all of my nonsense, I really appreciate it. Much love. Take care.